Let's pray together. Lord, we worship you, for you are uh, our God. Lord, you are the creator. Lord, you are the one who have, you loved us so much that you sent your only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And Lord, we rest in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for the way in which you have moved in our lives, the way in which you have brought us even into this room, and we recognize your presence. And Lord, we just yield our hearts to you. Lord, search us and try us and see if there be any wicked way in us that as your children we confess our sins and make things right, that we might hear your voice more clearly. And Lord, we love you. Father, we pray that you would take this moment, you would take this opportunity, Lord, just to teach us, Lord, that we would develop a foundation that guides everything we do. And Lord, I just pray that you would move powerfully in our midst, and it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. You may be seated, and I'm going to ask my new friend, Dr. Terry Mortensen, come on up here. Dr. Terry is with Answers in Genesis, a ministry that we've invited to come share with us this morning. In fact, not only this morning, but tonight and tomorrow night. And Dr. Terry uh, went to uh, Trinity Evangelical Seminary in Deerfield, Illinois, Masters of Divinity, and then went on to uh, did work in Oxford and then got a PhD from uh, University of Coventry. Coventry in England. So we are blessed that you're here. Uh, listen with an open mind and an open heart, and let's give Dr. Terry a hand. Well, good morning. It's great to be with you. Uh, I'm this first time in this part of Texas, which is so mountainous. It's just <laughs> amazing. <laughs> uh, I do work for Answers in Genesis, uh, where creation... Uh, based apologetics ministry, gospel preaching ministry in, based in northern Kentucky in the Cincinnati area. And uh, there in 2007, we opened our Creation Museum. And we've had millions of visitors from all over the world to our uh, 50 beautiful acres on, uh, with beautiful uh, uh, lake, a small lake, and walking trails with bridges over waterfalls. And we have a petting zoo for the kids and uh, a playground for the little kids to spend some energy, and uh, zip lines through the woods and over the lake for those who are uh, so desiring. Then inside, we've got a 4D theater. Uh, we, we talk about the connection of Genesis to what's happening in our culture. We have a, a, a representation of Noah's Ark built to scale, 1% of the Ark with animatronic workers on the scaffolding there. A big room that talks about Noah's flood and geology and the age of the earth. We have animatronic dinosaurs. We have a, an amazing Allosaurus fossil, 50% uh, of the skeleton, 95% uh, of the skull. And then we have life-size dinosaurs, an insectarium, beautiful collection from all over the world, and an exhibit on um, the sanctity of life and the abortion issue. Powerful, powerful uh, pro-life exhibit. And in the museum, we, we present the gospel. We don't force anybody to listen to it, but it's there very clearly uh, for those who want to listen because we're not interested in just getting people to believe that there's a creator. We want them to come to know the creator and uh, be restored to a right relationship with him. Our bookstore is like a medieval castle, and uh, Christmas is a great time to visit the museum because we have about 300,000 lights and uh, live nativity and then in 2016, we opened our Ark Encounter about 45 minutes from the museum. It's Noah's Ark built to scale according to the dimensions given in the Bible. So it's one and a half football fields long, a half a football field wide, and four stories tall. Um, and it had three decks, the Bible says, so, so does ours. And it's built almost completely out of wood. And we've got 132 bays that uh, have teaching exhibits about what life might have been like on the ark. And uh, Noah is animatronic and talks to people about questions they have. We show how they could have caged animals and how they could have uh, just eight people could have fed and watered them all. And uh, we answer lots of questions people have, how many animals were on the ark, uh, how'd they get fresh air, fresh water. The really important question everybody wants to know, what did they do with all the manure? 
And, and we explain that, and it doesn't involve any high technology. So there are things for kids of all ages to learn, and uh, we've got a petting zoo there uh, where you can see some unusual animals and even ride some, and uh, a beautiful playground for the little kids and a zip line for the adventurous. Uh, we also have a virtual reality uh, experience, and it's a, a great time to visit at Christmas at the Ark as well. So what are we... Uh, what are we talking about this morning? Well, I want to talk to you about why this issue of creation and evolution matters. I've had the privilege of speaking on this issue in 35 countries, and I have found that most Christians today don't think it matters. And I've, In fact, I've found that most Christians haven't really thought about this issue, and they either say or uh, they, they imply that as long as you believe that God created and you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it, it really doesn't matter when God created, how God created, or how long, long he took to create. Uh, don't, don't worry about that. That's for the scientists to think about. Um, but I think that kind of thinking is a mistake, and so I want to share some reasons today. But in the course of my travels, uh, I've come to appreciate the uniqueness of America. This is a very unusual country in lots of ways. But one way that America is really unique is that America is the country with the greatest number of churches and seminaries and Christian colleges, the greatest number of Christian radio and television, and uh, bookstores and resources. We have books, DVDs, magazines, music, movies, concerts, camps, conferences. There's no country that is a close second place. But if you've been paying attention to this country over the last few decades, and especially the last few years, you'll realize that America is becoming less Christian every day. It's becoming anti-Christian. Why is that? Why is it that the country with the greatest number of Christian resources is becoming less and less Christian, even anti-Christian? Why is it that in 2009, Newsweek had a cover story, The Decline and Fall of Christian America? We are facing a moral crisis today that even many non-Christians are concerned about. Millions of pages of pornography on the internet destroying lives. We've murdered 60 million babies in America through Roe versus Wade uh, abortion. The divorce rate inside the church is almost as high as it is outside. Uh, the Supreme Court has, they think, redefined marriage. We have boys who think they're girls insisting on being on girls' sports teams in the girls' locker room. Uh, teen suicides are up in every state. We can't have the Ten Commandments in public buildings. We can't have prayer in Jesus' name in public schools. But we're starting to have Muslim prayers taught in public schools. So what's going on in this country? And it's not just out there in the secular culture. We've got problems in the church. Back in 2000 and. Uh, Nine, we commissioned America's research group, a, a respected research organization, to call around the country to, uh, to 20,000 people to find 1,000 people that fit this description. They were between the ages of 20 and 29. They grew up in conservative Christian homes and churches, and they rarely or never go to church now, and we wanted to know why. And we published the results of that survey and our analysis in the book, Already Gone, which had the subtitle, Why Your Kids Will Quit Church and What You Can Do to Stop It. Well, we found out a lot of things that we expected in that survey, but we also uh, had some surprises. One question was, when did they first start to have doubts about the truth of the Bible? And we thought the problem really started in, uh, in college, because the university is a very hostile place for the Christian today. But we were surprised. Most of them said they started to have doubts in high school, middle school, even in grade school. They were getting questions that were causing them to doubt the Bible, and they weren't getting answers. They weren't getting answers at home. They weren't getting answers in Sunday school or youth group, and they weren't getting answers from the pulpit. And those questions were lurking like, working like acid on their minds and their hearts. And so we called the book Already Gone because it revealed that most of these kids were already gone before they, uh, in, in their hearts and minds before they ever left the church physically. Well, we asked them what influenced them the most to doubt the Bible. And 45% said, it's the teaching of evolution in millions of years. And the ones who didn't give that as their first answer were influenced by those ideas. 
Well, those are the ones who left the church, and our study and other studies indicate most of them will never return. In 2015, we asked America's research group to do another survey, this time to find 20-year-olds who grew up in the church who are still in the church. And we published the results of that in the book, Ready to Return. And uh, we found some very disturbing things. We asked these 20-year-olds in the church, should abortion be legal? And 52% uh, said, yes, or I'm not sure. Is homosexual behavior sin? 44% said, no, or I'm not sure. Does the Bible contain errors? 39% said, yes, or I'm not sure. And why do you think the Bible contains errors? 52% said the teaching of evolution in millions of years. So what do all these things have to do with each other? The growing moral crisis, the growing anti-Christian attitudes in our culture, the mass exodus of young people from the church. Well, Psalm 11.3 says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? You know, foundations are very, very important. Here you have a really nice house. It's got nice doors and windows, carpet and curtains, and a good roof over the top. It doesn't leak when it rains. But there's one thing about that house you don't see, and that is the foundation. And if the foundation has cracks in it, if the foundation has termites, it's only a matter of time. It might take years, it might take decades. But sooner or later, that house will look like that because the superstructure cannot stand if the foundation is not secure. Now, we don't live in our foundation, but we better pay attention to it. And I want to submit to you today that the book of Genesis is foundational to the whole rest of the Bible. In fact, the first 11 chapters are foundational, either directly or indirectly, to every other doctrine in the rest of the Bible. And what we have seen happen over the last 200 years as first the idea of millions of years was developed by atheist and deist geologists, and then Darwin came along with his theory of biological evolution, and then the Big Bang Theory in the 20th century, the more over the last 200 years that the church has ignored those ideas, and uh, if they've taught Genesis at all, they've just taught it for its theological and moral truths, or the more the church has tried to harmonize those ideas of millions of years and evolution with Genesis, reinterpreting Genesis, the more the church has ignored or rejected Genesis over the last 200 years, the more we have seen the church and the culture of the once Christian West, Western Europe, Great Britain, North America, reject other doctrines as well. I could give you a lot of examples of the foundational importance of Genesis. Take the doctrine of sin. We're all sinners. But where was the first sin? Oh, Genesis chapter 3. And what is sin? Well, sin is failing to live up to the national average of morality in America. No, that's not. Well, actually, that is sin. <laughs> the national average is so low. But that's not the biblical definition. The biblical definition is sin is rebellion against the Creator. And everybody in this room and everybody watching on the Internet is a rebel because we're descended from the first rebel. Now, I would assume in an audience like this that most of us are saved, forgiven rebels, but we're still rebels, we're still sinners. Or consider the seven-day week. You know, you can determine the length of a day, a month, and a year by the movement of the heavenly bodies, but there's nothing up there that will tell you how long a week is. So where, where did that come from? It came from the fact that God created in six days and rested on the seventh. Nations. Uh, when I speak at the Creation Museum, uh, we have people from all over the world. And uh, there are people that have light brown skin. There are people with very dark brown skin. There are people with medium brown skin. Uh, there are people that I suspect don't speak English as their mother tongue, maybe Arabic or Russian or Japanese. How do we explain that diversity of shades of brown skin color and, uh, and those different languages if we're all descended from Adam and Eve? Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. That explains where the languages came from. And when we add our modern understanding of genetics to that event, it's easy to explain the variation in shades of brown skin color, eye shape, and other superficial physical differences in the human family. 
And I'll talk more about that tonight in my talk on ape men, Adam and the gospel. The, second, the first coming of Christ is prophesied in Genesis 3. The second coming is prophesied indirectly through the events of Noah's flood, Genesis 6 to 8. Or consider uh, marriage, sex, and gender. You know, we live in a culture today, really in a world, where a very tiny but politically powerful minority says, who says marriage is a man and a woman? Why can't it be a man and a man? Or a woman and a woman? Or one man and three women? Or three men? I mean, who says what marriage is? And uh, in our last presidential election, we had an open homosexual running for president. We have churches today that now have homosexual or transgender or bigender pastors uh, performing homosexual weddings. We have drag queens, men dressed up in wild costumes, uh, reading stories to the preschoolers at our public libraries in America, storybooks that affirm homosexuality, bigenderism, transgenderism, queer. It's all normal, kids. This is, this is normal. And... Uh, and then we have boys who think they're girls insisting on being in the girls' locker rooms and winning state athletic competitions. Is that wrong? Is it right? Why? Well, Jesus was once asked a question about divorce. The Pharisees came to him and said, Moses permitted us to divorce our wives. What do you say, Jesus? And Jesus said, well, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let mo no man separate. Jesus said, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts. But if you want God's perspective on marriage, you need to go back to the foundation of marriage. And he took them back to Genesis 1 and quoted from Genesis 2. And there Jesus affirmed two really important truths for our cultural context. The first is there are only two genders, male and female, and they are the creation of God, and they are determined by the DNA. At the moment that the, that the uh, egg is fertilized, before mom even knows she's pregnant, you have a boy or a girl. And you can't change your gender. You can cut off body parts, you can take hormones, you can change your hair, change your clothes, but you can't change your gender. And people who try are, are suffering. They, they need help, they need compassion, but they don't need to be affirmed in wrong thinking because believing what is not true is not the way to happiness and fulfillment. And the second truth that Jesus affirmed is that marriage is the invention of God, the creation of God. It's not the invention of man. And marriage is one man and one woman for life. And it's implied in this passage and taught elsewhere in scripture very clearly that sexual relations are only for within marriage. And therefore adultery and fornication and pornography as well as homosexuality and bigenderism and transgenderism. All these things are wrong because they're contrary to God's created order and God's commands. And God created the world the way he did, and he gave his commands for our good, for our blessing, for our flourishing. And when we go against God's created order and commands, sooner or later, we're gonna suffer negative consequences. So Genesis is foundational to the doctrines of marriage and sex and gender, and destroy Genesis in the minds of people so that all of that is mythology and you've destroyed the foundation for the rest of the Bible's teaching about marriage, sex, and gender. But I want to focus in my remaining minutes on a few other doctrines I've found a lot of Christians haven't thought about, including most of our seminary and Christian college professors, evangelicals, in all the countries that I've been in. And that's why most of those evangelical Bible scholars and theologians accept the millions of years, many of them accept evolution even human evolution. One of those doctrines is the doctrine of death. The Bible has a lot to say about death. We're all going to die someday, and we don't know when that will be. For somebody, it could be today, and it doesn't matter how old you are. Could be a car accident, could be a crime, could be a heart attack. Why is there death? And why is that death uh, sometimes on a huge scale? like the earthquake in Haiti 
uh, 11 years ago that killed 280,000 people, a lot more than the last one just a few weeks ago. Or the Japanese tsunami in 2011 that killed several tens of thousands of people. Or the hurricanes and tornadoes every year that kill hundreds and hundreds of people. Or, or pandemics like the Spanish flu at the beginning of the 20th century, the Black Plague and the coronavirus. And then it's not just human death we see, we also see death in the animal world, creatures that rip other creatures apart. And then when we go down below the surface of the earth, we see more death. They're called fossils. This is a dinosaur fossil. And all over the earth, on every continent, including underneath this church, underneath our museum in Kentucky, underneath the home that I lived in in Hungary when we were missionaries over there, everywhere, the earth is covered with sedimentary rocks containing billions and billions of former living things. We're living on a massive graveyard. Why is it there? Did God make the world that way? And when we look at that fossil record carefully, we see not only evidence of death, we see evidence of, of pain. We, some of the fossils clearly reveal to scientists that those creatures were buried alive. We see evidence of killing. There are creatures fossilized in the stomachs of other creatures. They didn't even have enough time to digest their breakfast before they were buried and fossilized. We find evidence of disease and thorns and extinction. And for the last 200 years, the scientific majority has been telling the world it's an absolute proven scientific fact. Two plus two is four. Those rock layers are millions of years old. But if, if God is telling us the truth, then we must reject the millions of years because the evolutionary view of death and the biblical view of death are diametrically opposed to each other. You see, in the evolutionary view, you have millions of years of death and disease and suffering, uh, animals ripping other creatures apart, uh, asteroids slamming into the earth, wiping out all the dinosaur dinosaurs supposedly 65 million years ago, along with about 90% 90 90 of the other species, according to the evolutionists. It's nature red in tooth and claw. It's the survival of the fittest which means that billions of unfit didn't survive. And it's that process, according to the evolutionists, that led to man's existence. But the Bible says exactly the opposite. It says man was created in a perfect world where there was no death, disease, natural disasters. Man sinned against God and that brought the judgment of God on the whole creation. So in evolution, you have death before man. In the Bible, you have man before death. You cannot believe both of those things at the same time. One of those views is right. The other one is wrong. And I believe what God said. And look at what he said. Behold, I have given you, he said to Adam and Eve, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. So man was originally vegetarian. He wasn't supposed to eat the animals, eat the plants and the fruit of the plants. In fact, God did not give permission to eat meat until after Noah's flood. Genesis 9, 3. God says, as I gave you the green plant, now I give you all things. So if you were planning on chicken dinner today, that's perfectly fine because we're living after the flood. But originally, it wasn't that way. But the next verse says this. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the earth, which has life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. So the animals were also vegetarian at the beginning. And notice the emphasis of the verse. It says, and to some beasts, and to some birds. No, it doesn't. It says, and to every beast, and to every bird, and to everything that moves. So originally, the alligator, the eagle, the lion, the Tyrannosaurus rex, they were all vegetarian. And you say, but yeah, but no. Now, wait a minute. Creatures that have really sharp teeth, that proves they ate meat. No, it doesn't. Come tonight, I'm going to talk about that when we look at dinosaurs and what happened to the dinosaurs. The animals were all originally vegetarian. And God tells us what he thinks of his creation in the very next verse. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. But it didn't stay very good for very long because God gave Adam and Eve a test, and they failed the test. They rebelled against God. 
And we read about the consequences of that fallen sin in Genesis chapter 3. And we need to pay careful attention to what the Bible actually says. Because there are Christian theologians and scientists who are telling the church that the only thing that happened in Genesis 3 was that man died spiritually. Well, Adam and Eve did die spiritually. They hid themselves from God, Genesis 3, 8 says. Their relationship with God was broken. But that was before God pronounced judgment. The very first creature that God judged was not Adam and Eve, but the serpent who deceived Eve. On your belly you will crawl. That same verse says, cursed are you, serpent, more than or above all cattle and beasts of the field. Eve was judged physically with increased pain in childbirth. Adam and Eve were judged physically in verse 19 with the death process beginning. And we know this was physical death because God said, from dust you came and to dust you shall return. The ground was cursed in verse 17 and it's implied in verse 21 that God killed the first animals to make the coats of skin to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve. And now we know today that most viruses and bacteria are helpful, but we now have nasty ones that cause serious disease and death. That's part of the curse. In verse 18, both thorns and thistles, the ground shall grow for you. So if God cursed the earth with thorns after Adam sinned, which is what the Bible says, we've got a big problem if we accept millions of years because there are fossil thorns in rock layers that the evolutionists say are three to 400 million years old. If those millions of years are really true, then God lied. Thorns and thistles didn't come into the creation after Adam sinned. They were already in the creation for hundreds of millions of years. But if God is telling the truth, and I believe he is, this fact alone, this is one fact alone that is reason to reject the millions of years. There are good scientific reasons for also rejecting that. We'll get into some of those tonight and tomorrow night. But that's an important biblical and theological reason. There's another reason we should reject the millions of years because evolutionists have studied dinosaur bones and they have found evidence of brain tumors, arthritis, and cancer in those bones. Why is that a problem? Well, according to the evolutionists, all the dinosaurs uh, lived at least 65 million years before man. So that means that they lived in the time period that Genesis 1 describes. But if that's really true, then we had cancer, arthritis, brain tumors in the creation for millions of years before Adam in a time period that God called very good, which then means God called cancer, brain tumors, arthritis, very good. But what kind of a God would call those things very good? I don't know any humans who think they're good. We spend billions of dollars every year fighting those things. And then we come to the New Testament. In a chap in Romans, Paul says, we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. So the Bible says we don't live in that original very good creation. We live in a fallen creation, a groaning creation, a cursed creation. Oh, it still bears the evidence of God's creative handiwork in the beautiful plants and animals and the amazing human body and the orderly movement of the heavenly bodies. But when we look with open eyes, this isn't a very good world. It's a world also filled with death and disease and suffering. So when I hear Christians say, or I sense they think, the age of the earth doesn't matter, don't worry about that. I know they haven't really thought through carefully, if at all, this issue of death, because the conflict over the age of the earth, whether it's a little more than 6,000 years, as the Bible clearly teaches, or it's billions of years, as the evolutionists say, that conflict is a conflict over two histories of death. In the evolutionary view, no death at the beginning, no death at the end. Sandwiched between those two, we have death. And the Bible calls death an enemy. It's a temporary part of history. But in the evolutionary view, as long as there's been life, there's been death. As long as there will be life, there will be death. It's been going on for millions of years. It's gonna continue for millions of years. So why do you cry when your dog dies? Why do you cry when your grandmother dies? Or your spouse? 
or your child. It's normal. It's natural. And yet everything in our soul says, it's not right. It shouldn't be that way. And we cry, and we should cry. Two different histories of death. In the church today, there are a lot of different views on Genesis, particularly Genesis 1. Theistic evolution, progressive creation, the framework hypothesis, the gap theory, and there are a lot of other views I could talk about. The cosmic temple view, the analogical day view, the revelatory day view, the day gap day, gap day view. Lots of different views. They all have different ways of interpreting Genesis 1, but they all have one thing in common. They all accept the millions of years of death and disease and suffering. But I have found in my reading and in my conversations with people that most people who accept the millions of years don't realize they're accepting millions of years of death and disease and suffering. They just think big numbers, millions of years, no problem for God, we don't need to worry about that. But it's what the evolutionists say happened in those millions of years that is the problem. And there are a lot of biblical and scientific reasons, which I'm going to talk about some uh, tonight and tomorrow night, why we should reject those various old earth views. But a major reason is we can't accept the millions of years without destroying what the Bible says about the original creation, what it says about our present fallen cursed creation, and what it says about the future redemptive work of Christ. So Genesis is foundational to the doctrine of death. And destroy Genesis in the minds of people, which is what evolution in millions of years does. And you will make it very, very difficult to answer the number one skeptical question. It's a question you probably all heard. Maybe it's a question you've asked. Maybe you know somebody who's struggling with it right now. And the question is this. If there's a loving, all-powerful, good God... Why is there suffering and death in the world? Have you ever heard that question? That's a great question. And if we don't believe Genesis, we don't have a good answer. We might say, well, God is loving, all-powerful, and good, and I guess he made the world the way he did to test our faith and build our character. Well, he will do that if we trust and obey him, but that's not a satisfying answer. Not to a skeptic, and not to me either. Because what kind of a God made a world like this? I submit to you the correct answer is he didn't make a world like this. This is not the world God made. This is the world God made and cursed. It's a fallen world. It's a broken world, not because God is a lousy creator who doesn't care, but because God is holy and man is sinful and God judged. So without Genesis, don't have a good answer on that question. That leads right on to the gospel. Genesis is foundational to the gospel. And the very firm verse promise of the Messiah, the Savior of the world, is right there in Genesis 3. It's a very obscure promise. It doesn't tell us very much. It just says that a male descendant of Eve is going to come and destroy the work of the serpent, which later scripture tells us was empowered by Satan. And then as we go through the rest of the Old Testament, we have more prophecies or predictions about that coming Messiah, most of them already fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus of Nazareth. And then we come to the New Testament, and in a chapter on the resurrection in 1 Corinthians, Paul calls Adam the first Adam, and he calls Jesus the last Adam, and he says, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Well, you can't have the gospel without the last Adam. You have to have Jesus born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, did the miracles to prove that he was the unique son of God, died on the cross a substitutionary death to pay the penalty for your sins and my sins and the sins of the whole world so that anyone who repents, who turns from their sin, who admits their spiritual bankruptcy, who admits that they deserve the judgment of God and who puts their trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will be forgiven and restored to a right relationship with God. Then he was laid in the tomb. Three days later, he rose from the dead. Forty days later, he ascended to heaven. And he's waiting until the Father sends him back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the judge of all the earth. You have to have the last Adam for the gospel. But I submit we can't have the gospel without the first Adam either. Because if Adam wasn't a real man in a real garden with a real tree and a real wife who had a real conversation with a real serpent, 
And I don't know why we have trouble believing this. We have talking parrots today, and there's nothing miraculous about it. I was in Bolivia a few years ago speaking, and I met a pastor who showed me on his cell phone his, uh, a YouTube video of his two pet parrots singing Spanish worship songs. It was hilarious. I don't know Spanish, but I could hear very clearly. Señor! And those birds could even roll their R's. It was amazing. Well, now they're just mimicking. But the Bible says that serpent was, in, was empowered by a supernatural being called Satan. Just as the supernatural God used a donkey to speak to the prophet Balaam in the book of Numbers. And if you say, well, listen, I, I'm, I'm university educated in the 21st century. I don't, I don't know about those talking animal parts in the Bible. Well, listen, folks, if you don't believe those, you don't have any logically consistent basis to believe any miracle in the Bible because it doesn't take any more faith to believe that a supernatural being can make an animal talk than that he can part the Red Sea, cause a virgin birth, or raise a man from the dead. You see, the Bible is not about the man upstairs. It's not about the heavenly grandfather. It's about the almighty creator of heaven and earth. And he says that there is a being who is not equal to him, but is more powerful than us, individually and collectively, called Satan. And he's the deceiver of the nations. And Satan is alive and well on planet earth along with his demonic hordes, and they're deceiving nations. They're deceiving Christians. So if the early chapters of Genesis are not history, if that's mythology, if that's make-believe, then Jesus died for a mythological make-believe problem, and he is a mythological make-believe savior, offering us a mythological make-believe hope. And the non-Christians understand this better than a lot of Christians. Listen to the words of Richard Bozart, an atheist, writing in the American Atheist magazine. Christianity has fought, still fights, and will fight science to the desperate end over evolution. Well, it's not science, as I'll show you tonight and tomorrow night. I hope you come back. It's not science. It's mythology masquerading as science. Because evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve in the original sin, which is what evolution does, and in the rubble, you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. Take away the meaning of his death. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. And hundreds of millions of people in this country and around the world haven't even been willing to listen to the gospel, much less believe it, because they've been brainwashed into thinking that this book is based on mythology. But the truth is, Jesus did die on a hill outside Jerusalem for our sins. And the tomb was empty on the third day. Well, in our Creation Museum and in our literature, we talk about what we call the seven seas of history. Seven words that start with C that remind us of seven key events in the Bible to understand the world we live in. Creation. That explains why we live in a world with all these beautiful plants and animals and people, uh, confusion, uh, corruption, the fall of Adam. That explains why it isn't such a beautiful world. It's a world filled with death and disease and suffering. Catastrophe, Noah's flood. That explains why we live on a planet filled with thousands of feet of sedimentary rocks containing billions of former living creatures. Confusion, the Tower of Babel, that explains why we have different people groups and languages and distinctive physical characteristics in those people groups. Christ, who came into the world to solve the problem that started in the garden, to reveal God, but not just to be a good example, but to die on a cross, to pay the penalty for your sins and my sins, so that if we would repent and trust in him, we would be forgiven. And then, as a result of his resurrection, one day he's coming again. And the consummation will bring an end to all the death and disease and suffering. That event's still future, but it will be history someday. The seven seas of history. But here's what's happened over the last 200 years. As a result of the teaching of evolution in millions of years, most of the church has ignored the first four seas, and the world has rejected them. And once you destroy those first four seas, you've destroyed the foundations for the last three. And so it's no surprise that we have whole denominations today 
They're called theologically liberal. They don't believe the Bible is the word of God. They don't believe in miracles. They don't believe in the atoning sacrifice of Christ. They don't believe in the resurrection. They, they shouldn't be called Christian. They're just social clubs with a veneer of Christianity. And what have we seen in the culture? Growing atheism and paganism. So Genesis is foundational to the gospel. Destroy Genesis in the minds of people and you will see them either redefining or rejecting the gospel. Well, I want to return to where I started. Genesis is foundational to morality. And the more that you teach children and adults and uh, congressmen and presidents and Supreme Court judges and heads of Hollywood and heads of corporate America and university professors, that they're just animals descended from some other animal which descended from pond scum which formed by chance in the primordial oceans about three and a half billion years ago uh, on an earth that formed by chance as a result of a sun that formed by chance, as a result of a big bang that happened by chance, the more you teach people that, the more they're going to reject Genesis, and the more they reject Genesis, the more they will reject biblical morality. It makes perfect sense in an evolutionary view. Listen to the words of William Provine, a leading evolutionist, professor at Cornell University. He, was a, uh, he grew up in the church in the Midwest, but he was an atheist when he said this. Let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary biology tells us loud and clear. There are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. There's no life after death. When I die, I'm absolutely certain that I'm going to be dead. That's the end for me. There's no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning to life, and no free will for humans either. Wow, doesn't it excite you today to know that there's absolutely no purpose or meaning to your life and no right or wrong? If evolution is true, that's perfectly logical thinking. Well, I never met Dr. Provine, but I'm, I'm absolutely certain that if I went into his office while he was tapping away on his laptop and I picked up his laptop and started to walk out, he wouldn't sit there and say, well, you can do whatever you want. There's no right or wrong. Hey, you can't do that. That's stealing. Hey, Dr. Provine, what's stealing? That's just your personal opinion. I don't happen to agree with you. And I have a gun in my pocket, so what are you going to do about it? No, I wouldn't do that. But you see the problem? So he preaches this to the students, and the students believe him. You can go on any secular university campus today, and you see students living this philosophy. There are no moral absolutes. There's no purpose or meaning to life. You just invent your own values. Well, I know he doesn't believe it anymore because he died in 2015 from cancer. He now knows there's life after death. He now knows there's moral absolutes. You see, if six creation days are in your past, this book is true right from the very first verse. That means that God made you and me and he makes the rules for our good and for our blessing. And it's not a matter of your opinion or my opinion or majority vote in the culture or majority vote in Congress or majority vote in the Supreme Court or unilateral decisions by a president. God makes the rules. But if millions of years are in your past, then this book is not true. It's written by pre-scientific, primitive, superstitious Jews and Christians. So you don't need to listen to what they have to say. You can just make your own rules. What's good for you is good for you. What's good for me is good for me which is a great idea, unless, unless you're all black and you live in my town and I'm white and the mayor and a member of the Ku Klux Klan, or you're all Jewish and you live in my country and my name is Adolf Hitler, then it's not a nice idea because then it means whoever has the power determines what's right. See, there are two, basically two worldviews controlling people's thinking. The naturalistic worldview, which dominates the world in every country, it's really an atheistic worldview, and the biblical worldview. On the basis of those foundations, you have a completely different morality. You have moral relativism versus moral absolutes. You have marriage being defined any way anybody wants to define it. You have marriage one man and one woman, and sexual relations only for within marriage. You have 52 genders, Facebook says. Now the Bible says, and reality says, there are only two genders. And in the naturalistic worldview, 
You get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. Our, our first dog, Shadow, developed severe diabetes and blindness at the age of seven. Broke our hearts. We took her to the vet and put her down. My mom had glaucoma and incurable heart disease. I took her to the vet and put her down. <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I didn't. Because my mom, my mom is made in the image of God. My dog was not. There's a vast difference. But not in an evolutionary view, because you're not made in the image of God, according to evolution. You're just an animal descended from some other animal. On the naturalistic worldview, you can't have biblical morality. And we're seeing biblical morality completely collapse in the Western world where the gospel once had such a powerful impact because the foundation has been destroyed. So we see all these issues. And a lot of people think they're the problem, but they're not the problem. They're the symptom of the problem. The problem is at the foundational level of what we believe about where we came from. And in particular, what we believe about Genesis 1 to 11. And over the last 200 years, the scientific majority, controlled by an atheistic, naturalistic worldview, has been using science, falsely so-called. It's not really science, as I'm going to show you tonight and tomorrow night. And they have been hammering away at Genesis 1 to 11, the most attacked part of the Bible. And during those 200 years, many Christian leaders have told the church, oh, it doesn't matter how old the earth is. Don't worry about evolution. Just believe in God and believe in Jesus. Many Christian leaders have told us to fight the moral issues. But the problem is many of those Christian leaders are also telling the church, it doesn't matter what you believe about Genesis and the age of the earth and, and evolution. I mean, the real issues are we got to do something about abortion. We got to do something about the LGBTQ agenda. And I agree, but the foundations is in Genesis. The foundation for resisting abortion and resisting the LGBTQ agenda is in Genesis. And so we need to rebuild the foundations because they are being attacked. But it's not just evolution versus creation. It's really man's word against God's word. The words of scientists who were not there at the beginning, who were not there during the millions of years as if they saw it all with their own eyes, who don't know everything, which is why they're scientists, who make mistakes, which is why they keep rewriting their textbooks, and who are in rebellion against God. Most of them, just like most people, trying to explain the world without God. Versus the word of God, who was there at the beginning, who was there all the way through history, who knows everything, who never makes mistakes, who always tells the truth, who gave us his book and he never has to rewrite it, so that we would know the truth, the truth about him, the truth about us, what's right with us, we're all made in the image of God, what's wrong with us, we're all sinners in need of a savior, and what God has done about that sin problem and what he will do. It's a battle of man's word against God's word. And we're bombarded not with cannonballs, but with ideas through the media, through books on dinosaurs for children, through the state and national parks, the television science programs, the natural history museums, the textbooks, the universities. They're just hammering, hammering, hammering. Evolution is true. Millions of years is true. Genesis is a myth. It's myth. It, don't believe it. And so what's happened is children are growing up in Bible-believing homes and churches in this country and around the world. And most homes and churches, they're not being given any answers to deal with evolution in millions of years and so by the time they graduate from high school they've been evolutionized and their parents have been evolutionized because the kids come home and say mom and dad what you learned in school I mean that was millions of years ago I mean we saw in class the scientific evidence that dinosaurs evolved into birds and and we we learned in class last week that radiometric dating proves the rocks are millions of years old come on mom well son don't worry about that you just go on to youth group and believe in Jesus. But they can't believe in Jesus if they can't believe the book that reveals Jesus to them. And so the foundations are being destroyed. Evolution in millions of years, does it really matter? Yes, those ideas destroy any basis for morality. They contradict the Bible's teaching on death. They make the gospel unbelievable. They undermine the reliability and authority of the Bible. 
and what the Bible teaches and what real science confirms, and I'm going to show you some of that science tonight and tomorrow night, and what our culture is increasingly revealing to us is that evolution in millions of years are destructive lies. So we need to rebuild the foundations, and that's why God has raised up answers in Genesis and the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter and, and other creation ministries to help the church understand that you can believe this book right from the very first verse. It's real science confirms what Genesis says. We are being brainwashed with pseudoscience. Now, please note, this is a cartoon we are not advocating shooting evolutionists. Please. <laughs> we love evolutionists. We want them to come to know the Creator as we have. But we need to be ready to make a defense. We need to be ready to give an answer to our children, our grandchildren, our unbelieving neighbors. They've got questions. And in many cases, they are legitimate questions. They're not just scoffers. They, they really are struggling with questions about where did Cain get his wife? Where do the races come from? Carbon-14 proves millions of years. What do you do with that? And there are answers, and you don't need a science degree to learn the answers. And so I want to encourage you. We've got a lot of resources here this weekend. The Lie by Ken Ham, our founder and CEO, explains in more detail from what I've said why the church cannot compromise with evolution in millions of years. Very easy reading, but a powerful book. We have answers books for teenagers and adults that answer 130 of the most questions about dinosaurs, carbon dating, race, origin of races, Cain's wife, natural selection, mutations, distant starlight. And we've got DVDs that answer some of those same questions in five to seven minute video answers. And we have answers books for the grade school kids. Each one answers about 20 questions with a one page answer. We have quick answers if you're not a big reader. Uh, these are one to two page answers to a, a lot of different questions on evolution and creation and the flood. Quick answers on social issues like LGBTQ, social justice, euthanasia, abortion, racism. The Glass House explains what's wrong with the 25 most common arguments evolutionists have used to brainwash the public with evolution in millions of years. In this lecture, uh, one of many DVDs we have, I explain what's wrong with the various old earth views in the church. In this one, I show that natural selection mutations in the fossil record do not support Darwinian evolution. They confirm what Genesis says. Andrew Snelling on our staff is a PhD geologist. This is a good introduction to some of the overwhelming geological evidence for a young earth and global flood. We have a DVD for uh, young kids on dinosaurs. Uh, books for preschoolers, a book on dinosaurs for kids of all ages, a book on the six days of creation and why the church can't compromise with those old earth ideas, uh, a book that I co-edited and contributed to with 13 other scholars defending the young earth view in an in-depth way, biblically and historically. Any book or DVD, you can combine those together and make your own combinations and save a lot of money that way. And uh, we also have a, a a magazine that comes four times a year, beautiful full-color family magazine. You can get a free DVD for each year you subscribe, as well as a digital subscription free. You can sign up for that in the bookstore. And uh, we have a free newsletter. You can sign up for that on the table. And we have over 10,000 articles on our website. And don't forget uh, to uh, make a trip up and see the amazing Creation Museum and Ark. You'll need two days to do that. You can't see them both in one day. And I encourage you to look at the schedule and the topics. Uh, we only talked basically about the biblical issues. Tonight we're going to look at Bible and science. And if you understood what I said this morning, you will understand what I talk about tonight. So God bless you. Come back tonight. I can't think of too many things that are going to be more important than this kind of a foundation. This is why we're going through the book of Genesis, to lay a foundation to build a strong house of faith within your own heart. Tomorrow morning, I don't know if you've noticed in the announcements, but there's a session for children, uh, one at 9 a.m. for kindergarten through sixth grade, and at 10.30, uh, junior high and high school. And if you can make that, in fact, parents are invited to come as well. You have a great time. 
Uh, they haven't asked for any kind of love, love offering. Uh, the church paid for their expenses to get here. But there's lots of books. And if you want to bless this ministry and you want to learn a lot, uh, feel free to get as many books as you can. Give them to friends. Uh, if you're old enough like me, you can give them to grandchildren. And it'll be great. So let's all stand together. And before we pray, I want to say one more thing. Uh, if you're coming Monday night, which you are, I'm sure you are, uh, it starts at 6 o'clock. Tonight starts at 5. Monday night starts at 6. If you like coming from work and, and you want to grab a sack, a sandwich, dinner, we're going to make that for you, but you need to register for it. That way I'm not making a whole bunch of sandwiches that nobody eats. I'd like to know who's going to be eating it, so uh, just register for that. All right, amen? All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you for an opportunity just to learn more about you. Lord, your ways, your power. Lord, the intentions of your love and creation and making us in your very image. Lord, we stand on that fact and we receive your love. Lord, we, we confess that you are all loving, all powerful, and your love for us motivated you to send your son to die on the cross, to raise from the dead, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And Lord, we look forward to learning from you, not only in tonight and tomorrow, but also for all eternity of what you've done for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.